I'm Katie, mom to two littles and four angel babies. And I'm Sarah, an advocate for moms and children of all backgrounds and family types. With two PhDs between us and collective decades spent unraveling how society shapes women's experiences, we're here to shred the rule books and their relentless tide of expectations. In this safe space, the complexities of motherhood find the candid, unfiltered voice. We're Undefining Motherhood, one conversation at a time. Last week, we talked about how gender roles in the home are evolving, but even with many men doing more domestic labor than in generations past, the mental load still falls most heavily on women. This is leading to major problems at home. Unhappy marriages, higher divorce rates, and serious cases of mom burnout. So how can we do better? Enter New York Times bestselling author Eve Rodsky, whose fair play system is revolutionizing the division of labor within the home. Her 2019 knockout book, Fair Play, was an instant New York Times bestseller, a Reese's Book Club pick, and was named one of Forbes' best books in 2020. It made such an impact that it actually turned into a card deck, a documentary, and an institute that trains facilitators to support families rebalancing the load. In this episode, we chat with Eve about how moms in our community can use her systems to achieve greater equality at home, prepare for easier postpartum experiences, and find more time for themselves to avoid mom burnout. Eve offers practical, tested, research-based tips on things like how to negotiate home-related tasks, the importance of balancing the physical and mental load, and how to even approach this subject with your partner. Her research comes from years documenting the experiences of families of all sexualities, socioeconomic backgrounds, and even different nationalities. If you're in a partnered relationship, the tidbits you'll take from this episode will change your life. Today, you'll get started learning to rebalance your to-do list and reclaim your time. And stay tuned for next week's episode when Eve joins us again to talk about what women can do when they actually have less stress and more time. Finding a space to rediscover what makes us interesting, unique, and joyful. I'm Katie. Hi, Katie. And this is Sarah, Sarah. my co-host. We are so, so excited. To have you here today, we are both English PhDs who have done lots of work in gender studies and being able to actually sit down and talk to someone who is putting so much of what we talk about in, you know, our feminist conversations into action and making change for women around the world um, is just it's a, it's a really big honor. So we're very, very excited and grateful to have you here today. Well, thank you for being cultural warriors. I mean, your podcast is exactly what we need. I wish we I had uh, you guys, you know, when I had my first child, I was, I just had what to expect when you're expecting back then, like that one analog yes. book that I think told me my son was a jelly bean or whatever, but uh, did did not tell me what to expect when I was expecting at all. Exactly. Um, And I am just so excited to think about all the ways in which the messages that you're sharing in both Fair Play and in Find Your Unicorn Space can really support us as moms in these different stages. Um, So in the past couple of episodes of this podcast, we have been talking about all of the things that we say to women, ingrain in women, questions we ask women that we would never ask men. And so you are the perfect person to follow up those conversations. We started with things like, when you're going to have a baby? Who's watching the kids? <laughs> Who's watching the kids? Mm-hmm. Um, you Isn't know. your biological clock ticking? It's easy to blame ourselves for not saying you know the right thing at the right time um, or to feel like we're super alone and having to push back these cultural norms. So first I'll say thank you, Katie and Sarah, your your cultural warriors. Thank you for being part of this fair play movement. And the reason why I call it a movement and not just a book or a cards that help people, you know, organize what they have to do, all the unpaid labor that they have to do in their home. It's a movement because um, of what you just said. I wish 
uh, when I was the ghost of your Christmas future, I could have just said to you, I'm going to give you a way to divide up domestic labor. And that's ultimately what fair play is. But the problem was I had this very easy and straightforward way to treat your home as your most important organization. But in 2012, Katie and Sarah, I couldn't get anybody to the table. Right. I couldn't get women to the table. And that was what was so alarming to me, where women would say to me, there is no way I can ask for domestic fairness in my home. There's no way I could bring up, and we'll talk more about what fair play is, yes. but I'll just explain in two seconds, right? It's, it's a card game. There's 100 cards. It came from my own life story of almost leaving my marriage over a text my husband Seth sent me that said, I'm surprised you didn't get blueberries. And having that breakdown over being the fulfiller of his smoothie needs led me to create the system where um, the aha moment was that we treat our homes as our most important organization. Now, if we do that, then there's 100 tasks in this home organization that have to be handled uh, in the home. And the goal is that no one person holds all the cards yes. because that is a recipe for disaster. So why wouldn't that be the the default way that we do things, right? right? As one man says, he said to me before Fair Play, his home was one where they waited to decide who's taking the dog out right when it's about to take a pee on the rug every single night. And he was actually a systems analyst. Wow. And I was like, wait, you believe you you create systems for a living, which is how to make decisions. And you still are deciding every day who's taking the dog out. You haven't made that decision in advance. So fair play is really this idea of ownership, yes. right? You have a hundred cards and you you redeal the cards, you play the cards. It doesn't have to be 50-50, it just has to be fair. So it's a very actually straightforward way to run anything, right? Even my Aunt Marion's Mahjong group, guys, <laughs> yes. has more clearly defined expectations in the home, right? You bring, don't bring snack twice to that group, you're out. But the home, um, we're not thinking of it as an organization. So very straightforward, fair play is not rocket science, and we can talk more about how people play. But what was so alarming to me was the amount of women, and again, this is 2012, it's, it is different in 2023, but um, your audience is new to parenthood, so they may be going through the same things. And that was the amount of women who said to me, there is no way I could bring this up. So I'll give you an example. During the pandemic, there was a Facebook group because as you can imagine, everybody in the world brings me now anything that relates to unpaid labor and women. Do. So, <laughs> so I, this woman reached out to me and said, check, she tagged me in this Facebook group and she said, check this out. So there was a Facebook group and it was called The Reasons I Hate My Husband and Kids During COVID. Oh. Right. So, I mean, I, I think she was tagging me because she was like, when did you join? <laughs> right. Because I'm like, absolutely. But so there's a 27,000 member group out of the UK called The Reasons I Hate My Husband and Kids During COVID. The reason why she tagged me, because there was one woman posted, if my husband dies during COVID, it won't be because of the disease. It'll be because of me. Mm. So my team reached out to this woman um, and we said, hey, you know, this is on behalf of a researcher who deals with the home. Uh, what, you know, what's your division of labor like in your home? You know, what made you write this post? Um, how do you communicate with your partner? So she writes back kindly. Oh, I don't communicate about domestic life with my partner. This is my safe space. Oh, so can we just marinate on that for a minute? Yeah that publicly threatening to murder her partner in front of 27,000 strangers felt more safe to her than bringing up fairness to her partner. Wow. That's why this is a movement. Yes. Because we have to get past this barrier that somehow we are the she-fault parent. Yes. And I think it's really important for us to recognize that there are systemic barriers for why it feels safer yes. to say something like that in a Facebook group than it would to actually approach your partner about these issues. 100%. And I think, you know, something I've experienced in my own life is that it's very hard to approach these issues where your partner is not automatically going to get defensive. And this is the truth of anything, 
that's a potential small or large conflict in a partnership, right? If my husband comes to me with an issue, my gut is to go defensive um, in the same way. And so it's actually really interesting because we we kind of created our own fair play system before we learned about fair Yay. play. <laughs> um, when my son was about three weeks old and I had a meltdown that he thought he could go to bed and I saw all of this work that needed to be done and I was hooked up to a breast pump. But the problem with that system was that eventually the needs changed. Um, And what I really love about the system that you have set up is that, you know, you have set it up to address that as the needs are changing, particularly if you buy the playing cards, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Right now, my husband has his cards in in his his pocket pocket. because we just did a divvy over breakfast this morning. (laughs) He's so proud of them, too. He's so proud that he has two more cards (laughs) than me. Um, Oh, I love it. What's his name? His name's John. John. Oh, John. We love you, John. John, you are a cultural warrior because you you parent out loud. You say these things out loud because— we think, you may think, Katie, that that is normal, it is but not. John is still an anomaly, so we love we It love is not, John. and you know, I think, and even still with someone who is, he's very invested in this, he actually told me I needed to finish Find My Unicorn Space because I think that's going to be a really important conversation for us to talk about for this audience as well yes, in a little bit. Yes. Um, and I needed to finish it, and I have just been really struggling with my load at work recently. And so the night before last, he said, just go to a hotel. Just go to a hotel, check in, spend the night, order room service, read your book, get ready for your oh, interview. Love, we love John. Um, like this is an incredibly <laughs> supportive partner. But I will tell you, I bought Fair Play, the card deck and the book three years ago. And we only have recently begun actively implementing it. Now, we have clearly been talking about shared labor, domestic labor, mental load, and making those kinds of adjustments in our home for years. But we have only recently gotten to a point where it felt like, okay, we can talk about this where no one's being accused of anything. We can get to what you talk about as being, you know, the high cognition and the low emotion. um, And now we can sit down and focus on this. And so I'm curious, you know, for people, because when we read the book, when we watch the documentary, and the documentary is something I highly recommend for everyone, (laughs) because what you'll find is all of these, one, it's representations of all types of partnerships, not just heterosexual couples. And also, you'll find that even in those, you know, heterosexual cisgender couples, the Dads are always coming out saying in the end, our life is so much better. better. Seth, your husband says Mm -hmm. in the end, our life is so much better. And I think more people need to see that. But it also kind of begs the question, when we're watching that, what we see is a lot of people on the brink. You know, when you started the system, when you were at your breaking point, in that particular realm, I've never been at my breaking point. So... If you know you want to implement this sort of thing, but it's not just like last straw, do this or the highway, how do you bring that up in a way that is going to keep people off of that defensive, find those moments of low emotion and high cognition? How do you set your partner up for that conversation? Well, it's so beautiful you said that, Katie, because that's pretty much the data of what we find, that it takes about three years. (laughs) Oh, that's funny. Yeah, about three years from people to finding these concepts uh, where we are, you know, illuminating it for them to actually implementing Mm -hmm. uh, the fair play system. And I'll tell you why that is. It's because the secret formula, and we know this because of the documentary, we were able to follow um, hundreds of couples. And now, you know, we have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who play fair play in some way or another. But we... um, we able to follow couples who were, had implemented Fair Play in 2019 when the book came out, right before the pandemic, and people who hadn't. We got to compare their their angst. And, I, and as you can imagine, the people who had implemented Fair Play before the pandemic um, were doing a lot better. Mm-hmm. And that is in terms of two markers we asked them about, perceived fairness in the home. So they were perceiving fairness even through the pandemic, which a lot of people weren't, aka that Facebook group. And they were also, um, they said that their stress level was manageable. Mm -hmm. So those are two really important uh, markers. 
I think of what fair play does for people because it's a tool. Yes. It's a tool. Um, the card game, the book, it's a, uh, the documentary, however you enter the conversation, it's a tool for you to use at your will. But the reason why it takes three years or, you know, sometimes it takes less, but that's often it takes less only when those two partners are ready to implement systems. Yes. For most people, they had never heard this before. So they need three things. And the secret formula is boundaries, systems, and communication. Mm. So how do I know that that was going to be a hurdle anyway? Because my day job for years is that I'm a lawyer. I work for families that look like the HBO show Succession. You've heard yes. me say that. Um, you should all feel bad for me. They <laughs> are <terrible>. very <laughs> difficult clients. I actually had a dream last night okay. about a client um, where I was like locked in a room with his family. It's so weird. Um so yeah, so still a lot of stress from those those clients. But what I do for those families is I create grace and humor and generosity around really complex organizational decisions. So once I did that for these families, I figured I could do it for my own family. And that's how Fair Play was born. But the thing is that when you think about a holistic, thriving organization, systems is just one piece. So when I started to think about what I was going to do for my own home, which was either eat, pray, love this shit away from my husband and go to 50-50 custody. That was one option. Or become my own client and create fair play, which is what I ultimately ended up doing. And yes, I'm still married to my husband, Seth. But what the first thing I did was I said, if I'm going to treat the home as an organization and try to develop a system that's going to work for us, there are three things that I tell my clients that need to be there that are non-negotiables for a healthy organization. And those are boundaries, systems, and communication. So the reason why it takes so long, the three-year arc, and again, for those listeners who've never heard these concepts before, A, thank you, we didn't give you a trigger warning. These are very complex and, and, and hard topics because we're talking many things. And, and B, um, it's okay. This is your 101. Exactly. Keep keep learning. Keep you could read the book. You could watch the documentary. You can see on you can just even if you don't want to do that, you can go on TikTok and just search for fair play. You'll see a million creators who've made the system exactly. their own. You can listen to this podcast, stick with undefining motherhood. They'll be talking about this hopefully for for years. This episode is sponsored by Gene 8 by Snip Therapeutics providing genetics-powered nutrition tailored for every stage of the fertility, pregnancy, and postpartum journeys. Imagine a world where mothers have more control over their health and their baby's development, where maternal health isn't just a hashtag, it's something that really matters. This is the dream Gene is turning into a reality. Through personalized nutrition insights, Gene helped me learn exactly how my body processes and struggles to process different essential vitamins and nutrients. Their focus is on the nutrients that are most essential for babies' cognitive development, making them a dream for moms who are trying to conceive, pregnant, or nursing. And they didn't stop there. They gave me personalized recommendations for how to adjust my daily intakes and their new prenatal vitamin adjust to the needs they see most often in moms. Their approach isn't just about supplements or tests. It's about understanding and nurturing our unique bodies during some of life's most crucial phases. Gene gives me hope for a future where every mother can feel empowered and supported in her health care. Check them out at undefiningmotherhood.com forward slash Gene and use code undefiningmotherhood10 for 10% off. You brought up with COVID something that, you know, Sarah and I had said we really wanted to ask you about. You know, COVID broke a lot of our systems, right? And you talk about that in the documentary, how you're hearing people doing better during COVID who had already implemented fair play, but also you still had to make adjustments Start over. and readjust. Mm -hmm, yeah. And what I love about your system is how it allows that readjustment. Um, because what you need when you have a three-week-old and what you need when you have a three-year-old and a 13-year-old are all completely different. And the cards, for the most part, really help you navigate all of that and kind of re-exchange, which I think is amazing. But I'm especially curious for our expecting moms, and I'm going to pull out because we, we pulled a statistic here. Actually, you know what? I never wrote that statistic down. Um, so I'm going to just find it here. It's on page 54 of Fair Play for anyone who has a paperback copy. <laughs> 
What it talks about is how you say, I'm just going to read to you if you'll humor me for that. According to one study, after bringing home baby, men increase their total workload by about 40 minutes a day, whereas women pick up more than two hours of additional childcare work per day on top of their regular housework and paid work. These hours add up to an additional 2.6 weeks of 24-hour days over the course of a year. So if you are going through the Fair Play card deck, if you are reading the Fair Play system and you're expecting, Mm -hmm. you're putting yourself in a really good place. Um, You get to get rid of like 40 of the cards that are about kids that you're going to get to divvy up later. And some of them aren't going to be important when they're babies because they're about homework and friendships. And so you can kind of build your way into it. But we also know that much like COVID, even if you already have the systems and structures in place, there is going to be this massive hiccup to your system in a time when your body is healing, your brain is not at full cognition in any way, your hormones Hormones. are all over the place, you're finding yourself falling into these roles. This is something John and I talked about is like, we fell into a lot of traditional gender roles at this point. And it's not even clear how we got there. Um, Like, I, I don't think he necessarily pressured me into them I think it's more that I have internalized these messages my entire life. And so I thought it's my job to do this. It's my job to do that. But then that sets a precedent that we have to actively decide to break. So for these families who are listening to this and they're like, okay, you're telling me the domestic labor is going to get way harder when a kid comes and you're telling me the gender gap is going to get worse What do we do with that? How do we prepare? How do we take ideas from something like fair play and then be prepared to not only implement ahead of time if we can, but to make that shift once that baby's born? Because so much does change at that point. Such a great question. Um, I think I asked that this question, like what would have been the most helpful concept of fair play to know before we had kids? For women who are married to men, I want you to understand that it's not your fault on average, men men do five to 15 hours a week less, less after kids come a- along. Um, whereas the fair play, as, as Katie just said, the fair play deck, there's 100 cards. There's 60 in play if you do not have children to run mm-hmm. an organization, a home organization between two partners. You add 40 additional cards, 40 when you bring a child into the world. And that doesn't mean you're playing with all cards at all times, as as Katie and Sarah were talking about, but it is very important to understand that the workload almost doubles. And so it's not your fault, right? Of course, it's going to create a massive amount of conflict when all of a sudden all this work is dumped on your plate. And the expectations are for men, quote, this is what I heard all the time, there's not much for me to do in the first six months because my wife's going to breastfeed. When there are about... 60 cards you could hold from thank you notes to meal prep to the dishes to bottle washing and on estate planning and life insurance, middle of the night comfort uh, for your partner and the child, just on and on and on. So I think that the expectations is where we get hung up. So what did I ask? I asked Seth, I said, what would have been the best, if I'm the ghost of your Christmas future out there to your listeners? What would be the most helpful thing to to learn? And I think it's what Seth said is CPE. Mm -hmm. So let's just talk about what CPE is, conception planning execution. So it's a term that fair play is based on. So I'll give you just some context. When I started to write on my whiteboard that I wanted to stay in my marriage, but I needed things to change. The first thing I wrote was the home as an organization. And then I wrote boundary systems communication because I knew that that's what the home needed. So, of course, you know me a little bit now. You can imagine what I started with. I started with systems because that's the easiest. And I'm a lawyer and lawyers believe that laws and systems are what change the world. Because if you want someone to stop at a stop sign, what do you do? You pass a law to make them stop at that stop sign, right? So we are the ultimate behavior designers of society. So I started with systems. And then what from there was really frustrating 
was I couldn't get data over who was doing what in the home because men overreport what they do and women significantly underreport. So when I would start to ask people, once I had my amazing shit I do spreadsheet, which turned into the fair play cards, who does what? I would say, you know, who's in charge of uh, dishes? Well, we both do that. Who handles groceries? We both do that. Who's dealing with meals? Oh, we both grab meals. Uh, who does laundry? Oh, we're both doing that. So it was just very, very hard to get at the data I needed. So then I started to ask a question that changed my life. And this is where we get to the CPE mm -hmm. concept. I asked instead of who does what, I asked, how does mustard get in your refrigerator? And why that, that became so powerful was I was able to ask it now, I don't know, 16, 17 countries that translated fair play and more. And women married to men, regardless of whether it was Sweden or Norway or mainland China, it was the fucking same answer to the point where it was creepy. Sociologists call it saturation point where I can predict people's marriages based on this one question. Women were the ones noticing that their second son, Johnny, used yellow mustard with his protein. Otherwise, he choked. He wouldn't eat it. That is, in the business world, what we call conception. You notice things. You get paid big bucks for noticing things. Then I heard from women that they were the ones monitoring the mustard for when it ran low and getting stakeholder buy-in from their families for what they needed on the grocery list. I mean, they didn't call it stakeholder buy-in, but I was listening for these organizational management terms. That is what we call planning. And then men were telling me, yes, they're involved in grocery shopping because they go to the store, but they're bringing spicy Dijon home every freaking time, right? And we asked for yellow mustard. And so then women would say to me, well, I'm not going to trust him with my living will, Eve. The dude can't even bring home the right type of mustard. <laughs> That's fair. So what we're doing is we're losing accountability and trust, the two most important things we need in an organization. Because of a breakup of conception and planning, yes. what's in my head and my noticing and my planning is in my head. And I'm breaking up that task to hand my partner the execution of that task. Yes. It does not work in the workplace. It definitely doesn't work in the home. So when Seth understood that to hold a task, he had to be responsible for the conception, noticing what sports our kids wanted to play and asking around about what sports their friends were playing and planning, getting on an 85 person text chain to see how my kids were going to get to practice for when they were playing Little League or soccer or now basketball. He was going to be ordering equipment on Amazon and or wherever, uh, borrowing it and, and returning it when it didn't fit. He was going to be logging on to a school forum portal from 1980 to upload a birth certificate before you play the first day, showing up to that Little League field with water and sunscreen, um, appropriate protective gear. That is the ownership yes. of extracurricular sports. The ownership of groceries is not saying, what do I make for dinner or what do I get from the store? You hand me a list. Once he understood that, our entire life's changed. And that is the biggest concept. I wish that people who do not have children understand how helpful that will be when you have them and your workload exponentially increases. That when you can move from a helper mindset of a breakup of CP and E to an ownership mindset where one person for either one day, one year, for a lifetime, holds the CPE, like for example, I will hold the CPE for a lifetime of gifts because I love buying gifts and I will buy them for everybody, including myself. But the ownership of dinner, of the CPE of dinner, that switches every single night. Mm. And there's a minimum standard of care in our family, which, which was my fault. I never had green on the plate except for Lucky Charms marshmallows <laughs> yeah, that were green. About that. So Seth said, I need a vegetable on my nights, so you need a vegetable on your nights. That is a CPE ownership mindset that switches every night. So that is what I would say I wish for new couples, that they can understand the power of an ownership mindset in the home. Yes. And, you know, I'm going to start using this framework and, of course, crediting you for it because something people in our community are really familiar with hearing me talk about this is I talk about ownership, particularly in this pregnancy to postpartum transition. Um, and the example I always give is trash. And I say, look, let's say that your partner is responsible for the trash including the diaper pails when you have a new baby. What this does not mean is that you're reminding them that the trash is being picked up in the morning. You yep. are yep. saying, hey, 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 
the trash is full, the trash is overflowing, and then you're being getting that nag Nagging, label yeah. that, you know, we love to give to women. What that means is that they're figuring out systematically it takes two days for us to fill a trash can. And on the weekends, we fill it faster. So on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday, I will take out the trash. I will have an alarm in my phone for this particular day to take it down at this particular time for pickup. And when we run low on trash bags, it doesn't matter who's in charge of groceries. It is my job to put it on the list. Uh, Absolutely. Exactly. Times a million. Exactly. So that's something we really talk about a lot. So that, you know, that kind of translates a little bit for this audience. But I'm also really curious. And I want to say, I do want to say one thing about that. If you go on to fairplaylife.com and you go to, you click on the sub menu called cards, you can click on any card and see what that CPE is. So I'll give you an example. So garbage is just what you said. When you click on garbage, it says you have selected a daily grind card. Congratulations. On any day, there are 30s of these time-sucking jobs that must be done regularly, repetitive, and many specific time. So here's what it says about garbage. Really, how much trash can a family create? It's staggering. To CPE this card, at minimum, you take out the trash before the garbage truck turns the corner on your block. Whoever holds this card is responsible for anticipating when trash bags are running low. And a word to the wise, don't dare sit back on the couch until you put a new bag back in the trash can. So conception um, and planning, all non-apartment dwellers applying to the city municipality for garbage bins, taking note of garbage day, execution, planning and replacing bag in home trash can, removing full bags, placing full garbage bags in trash chute and outdoor bins, possibly labeling bins, using small trash cans and, and dumping those small trash cans into the larger bin, dealing with diaper pails, taking bins back out and in, driving to town dump, placing garbage in the alley, checking bins for overflow trash, and keeping the bins clean. The minimum standard of care is trash out of your home before it overflows, and if applicable, did the cans go out before trash day? So it's really not that difficult, but it requires that much work and execution and conception and planning just to deal with one card of the hundreds. So, I love that. I had no idea you had that tool on your site. Yes, it's yes, really cool. yes, yes. Go to the tool and then you can um, play with it because it's actually pretty funny. We've decided to gamify trash. So Alexa Good. goes off every Wednesday night because our trash comes on Thursdays. And whenever whoever hears the alarm, if you're closest to the trash can, you have to take it out. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yes, oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. Kids, That's so good. To you. Yeah. That's awesome. So, yeah. but this conversation we're having leads me to something you and I were talking about earlier mm-hmm. about this dynamic that we're talking about where you have the baby and then all of a sudden everything becomes, you know, the mom's role becomes so much more and we need to divvy that mm-hmm. up. What happens in same-sex households? How does that sure. look different? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I can't speak for the entire queer community, um, but one thing that I also appreciated about wa- watching the documentary and uh, reading your books, Eve, is your commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion um, and even Fair Play's commitment to uh, the National Domestic Workers Association. Mm-hmm. And what you guys are talking about, um, this is a little bit tangential, but you don't just say outsource everything, right? Like we're not putting no, everything onto no. the bodies of um, particularly black and brown women. Right. We're sharing the load in the home instead of bringing other people in or throwing money at a problem, right? Um, which I think is really important. Um, but for the queer community, I mean, again, I can't speak for all of it, but we just come in with sort of a blank slate, right? Mm-hmm. Like there are, right. we don't have these patriarchal roles. So we think it's funny when the alarm goes off and one person <laughs> just does it, you know, like so much of what I hear heterosexual couples talk about is this just kind of time suck of, of figuring out who's going to do what. And we're not perfect by any standard, but no, things just work a lot more easily. Yeah. Like I think there's a, a standard mm-hmm. of empathy mm-hmm. and a, of listening that makes a lot of fair play not really necessary for us. And in the documentary, too, when you were interviewing the queer couples, I could tell they were kind of struggling to come up with something to say. So, like, you know, we're not perfect, but for the most part, you know, when we— We're good. Yes, we're good. Um, How do you think that new parents in particular can kind of take from the queer community and and use a lot of these principles of, like, blank slate, there are no gender roles because we're the same gender— um, and apply that to parenting a- in order to make things a little bit more equitable and fair. 
Well, what was so beautiful is um, one of our one early fair player beta testers was this wonderful man named Patrick who started an organization called Rainbow Families. And uh, he found, you know, fair play, not through me or anything. I, I don't remember exactly how he found it, but he was super early on. Maybe he even got an, uh, an advanced copy because he was a really early adopter. But I think what he liked about using fair play for the rainbow families was that you could start with systems. Like you could just make things more more easy for the family by deciding, again, who who may be in charge of dinner that night, as opposed to having to un, uh, dismantle the boundaries and communication, which is so difficult, as we said earlier, right? With heterosexual couples, it's very defensive um, and women become complicit in their own oppression. Mm -hmm. So the things that I saw heterosis women say that I didn't see so much in the queer community was, well, my job is more flexible. My my husband makes more money than mm -hmm. me. I, I saw a little bit of those assumptions actually with gay men, where I saw the person who made less money was the expectation was that they would do more work without as much communication, which I thought was interesting. So sometimes the expectations of gender could, can unfortunately morph into money, like who mm -hmm. makes more money. But I, that was just one small nuance. But for the hetero cisgender couples, it was, I can't, you know, I, I can find the time. Um, like we're Albert Einstein. Somehow we can fuck with the space-time continuum. My partner is better at focusing on one task at a time. Things like in the time it takes me to tell him what to do, I should just do it myself. Mm -hmm. I'm a better multitasker. Somehow my brain as a woman is wired differently for wiping asses and doing dishes, right? These very like complicit in your own oppression ideals that actually I did not find in the queer community. I will say for women married to women, the funny thing that I write about in Fair Play was um, I did see a organizational breakdown, but the breakdown was more um, a double up. Right. Yeah. So in the hetero cisgender, I saw more of a, you know, this, oh, I'll, I'll help you if you ask. Yes. In the, especially lesbian women, or the, the couples in my early data from 2012 to 2016, the double ups were just making me laugh. Like, I was like, what is this? Because you're expected to do everything, women, you all have to do everything. There was like, somehow, like, we have to like, move through this world together, which was really beautiful. But it also manifested in like organizational inefficiencies I wasn't happy yeah, with. Yeah, it really does. Like both women showing up for everything or for the child, they're both on campus doing the like volunteer sandwich making. I'm like, I promise you, you don't have to always be together at the playground. Like <laughs> right. you can have unicorn space. Unicorn space, a mythical idea that is actively changing my life every single day. And no, I am not exaggerating. Tune in next week as we talk to Eve about this concept that's changing the lives of women everywhere. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the Undefining Motherhood podcast. It's been an honor to share this time with you. Remember, you're not just a listener. You're an essential part of our community. If today's conversation resonated with you, I have three simple requests for how you can help us grow. First, subscribe wherever you listened so you don't miss an episode. Second, we'd love it if you could leave us a review wherever you're listening to this podcast as that's one of the most important ways we can grow and share our message and community. And finally, we'd love to hear from you. Jump over to Instagram and find us at Undefining Motherhood where you'll see a post about this week's episode where we can continue the conversation. Thank you for being a part of the Undefining Motherhood community where together we're making change. Until next time, take care of yourself and each other.